Hello, good morning. Said this before, but in general, I mean, you can find professors who disagree, but I think trying to learn to solve differential equations in these classes is kind of a mug's game because you learn these techniques and they're very cute, but then they never are usable in the differential equations you actually want to look at. Like, I mean, to pick just a kind of classic example, the instant you add any kind of chaos or noise to a system, all of your nice integration by hand techniques break. Um, we presented integration. I mean, that was really calculus too, but it's one technique you should know. We will learn how to solve linear equations. That is important. That's down the line. But the only other real technique I want to give you is called separation of variables. There are a few, or at least one, very important differential equation that you can solve using separation of variables. And the idea behind separation of variables is this. When you have a derivative, if you're using Leibniz notation, you've got, depending on, on what your variable and what your um, unknown are being called, you have one of those, or, you know, dt, dt, or whatever. And this is a derivative. And it looks like a fraction, but it isn't a fraction. It's just notation for the derivative. I mean, you get toward this very firmly in calculus, too. But also in the calculus too, you see a lot of situations where even though this is not a fraction, this is just notation, um, if you treat it as if it were a fraction, you get true statements or statements that make sense. Like The statement that if y equals f of x and x equals g of t, the statement of the chain rule If dy dt, dy dx, and dx dt were fractions, the statement of the chain rule would be a trivial statement because those dx's would cancel and you just have the statement that dy over dt equals dx equals dy over dt. So even though they're not fractions, if you pretend that they are, you get something true. You get the statement of the chain rule. And separation of variables as a technique of differential equations is based on the same idea. Let's pick one of these. Let's say dy dx. The idea of separation of variables is to treat dy dx as a fraction. Get the y's and x's 
upon a different sides and then integrate. And that's one of those things that's probably going to sound completely incoherent when you see it written out like that, but hopefully when you see an example, it will click. Let's say dy dx equals negative six x y. So this is a differential equation. The derivative of y is related to y, also to x. You can't solve this using the technique from last week, the technique from last section, because their x's and y's are mixed together. If you scribbled that y out, we would be able to simply integrate both sides, but the y's there, we can't just scribble it out. So what do we do? Well, according to what I said here, we're going to treat this piece of notation, dy dx, as if it were a real fraction. And we're going to try to get our y's on one side and our x's on the other. So let's multiply both sides. by dx, the denominator of this alleged fraction. And now, let's divide both sides. by y. And now we have one over y dy equals negative six x dx. And you see that our y's are on one side, our x's are on the other. And the next thing we should do is integrate both sides. And on the right, one over y dy, we can integrate that. Our variable is y. The dy tells us that's the integral, that's the variable, sorry, that we're integrating in relationship to. The integral of one over y is the natural law. On the right, I might be getting my lefts and rights mixed up as I turn to you and then to the whiteboard. But on the right, okay, our variable is x. We're integrating with respect to x. So the integral of negative 6x is negative 3x squared. Um, we can combine our constants of integration. Remember that c is just an arbitrary constant. d is just an arbitrary constant. An arbitrary constant minus an arbitrary constant is still just an arbitrary constant. So if we subtract C from both sides, we get ln of Y equals negative three X squared. That's 
An arbitrary constant is an arbitrary constant, but to try to avoid any confusion, let's give it a new name, we'll call it T. And now you've got Y's and you've got X's and there's no derivative to be found. And this is at this point really an algebra problem. You want to solve for Y, you want Y equals something. The, um, the absolute value is going to add a wrinkle to this. But if we want to get rid of natural logarithms, we can use the exponential. And on the left, the exponential and the natural log cancel out. On the right, we can separate this. Having addition up in an exponent is the same as having multiplication of exponents. And now we can actually we can actually solve for the y here. Um, the statement that the absolute value of y equals something is the same as saying that y is plus or minus that something. And this is the idea of separation of variables. Um, there's one last bit of simplification we could do. It's a little tricky, or maybe a little sneaky is a better word, but capital E is an arbitrary constant. Capital E could be anything. But lowercase e to the capital E isn't arbitrary. Lowercase e to the capital E is greater than zero. So we have something that's greater than zero, but then we have a plus or minus sign in front of it. So we're going to say, well, lowercase e to uppercase e is some unknown constant. It originally had to be positive, but now it can be positive or negative due to this plus or minus symbol. So let's just replace that constant and the plus or minus symbol with some constant k. And K is allowed to be positive or negative. K is actually also allowed to be zero. Um, so this is what I'm claiming the solution is. But, I mean, I got this alleged solution kind of illicitly. I mean, 
In order to get the solution, I started by saying, okay, we'll treat dy dx as if it's a fraction and we can multiply both sides by dx. Well, dy dx isn't a fraction and we can't multiply both sides by dx. Um, I could have gave a formal argument. All I'm going to say is that in spite of that rather suspect and illicit thing, um, this technique works. dy dx is k times e to the negative 3x squared times negative 6x via the chain rule. K e to the negative 3x is y. So this is y times negative 6x. This does satisfy that differential equation. So even if we're doing something kind of fishy, we get the right answer in the end. Actually, I don't, it's not going to happen a lot in this undergraduate course. I'd say doing kind of fishy stuff and getting the right answer anyway is kind of something that happens a lot in differential equations. But that separation of variables, let's look at sort of the R differential equation. The simplest differential equation that can be given any real world meaning, I would say, negative, um, rather dy dx equals kx. I've said that this differential equation can be used in population models. It can be used in a bunch of models. The growth of population, the spread of disease, the spread of a rumor, the growth of new technology. It has its limits. All models have its limits. But this is something that shows up in a lot of places. Or rather, <laughs> a little embarrassing, but we better fix that before we go any further. That shows up in a lot of places. And because our variable, our independent variable is x, and our function, our dependent variable is y, we cannot integrate both sides. We cannot use the technique of fast section. If we had what I'd written before, if we had this, we wouldn't need any special technique. We could just integrate this Here, that doesn't work. Here, we can't just integrate this. And to, um, let me, let me pause a minute and make sure we're all clear on why that doesn't work. Here, y is a function of x. If we integrate both sides, we get this. So y equals the integral of k times a function of x dx. 
And now we're stuck because what's that integral? Well, there's no way to know because we don't know what y is. If y turns out to be a sign, the integral will be one thing. If y turns out to be an exponential, the integral will be something else. If we try to just integrate both sides, then to find y, we need to integrate, but we can't integrate until we know what y is. So we get stuck in this circular loop. What we can do is separate our x's and y's. Dy equals ky dx. Again, we'll treat dy dx as if it were a function, a fraction, and we'll multiply both sides by dx. And if we divide both sides by y, we get one over y dy equals k dx. And we have successfully separated our variables. The y's are on the left, the x's are on the right. And at this point, we integrate. And we're going to get something similar to what happened in our previous example. The integral of 1 over y is the natural logarithm. The integral of k is kx. We technically get two constants of integration, but we can combine our constants of integration together. This time, let's keep with the classics and call our constant of integration C. We, once again, we want to solve for y. Once again, the way to get rid of a natural logarithm is using exponentiation. The absolute value of y, once again, we can separate this. And then we again are in this situation where we've got a positive constant, but we've got a plus or minus in front of it. And rather than write that, leaping ahead slightly. Okay, now we're in this situation where we have a positive constant, but we've got a plus or minus in front of it. Y equals a constant, let's say capital K, times e to the kx. And as sometimes happens in undergraduate mathematics, you are really seeing stuff in reverse. Um, in calculus, 
we learn that e to the x is its own derivative. And in calculus, we almost only use e to the x. We're not taking a bunch of derivatives of 2 to the x or 3 to the x. Basically, all of the examples you see in calculus are e to the x. And then you get to differential equations and you say, oh, well, this, this lowercase e to the x, this solves this differential equation. And again, you're seeing the effect before, or rather you're seeing, yeah, you know, the effect before the cause. Um, what causes lowercase e to be so important is what I've just written down that it's the solution to this er differential equation that shows up in a hundred different places. So being the solution to this differential equation is really what makes E so important. And it's why back in calculus, we spent all our time looking at E to the X instead of five to the X or 10 to the x, or any other exponential. Any questions so far? Separation of variables is one of those, a technique that you genuinely should know. It's not, sadly, uh, differential equations doesn't have any kind of one-sized fit so technique, it's very easy to write down situations where separations of variables doesn't work. Something like dy dx equals the sine of x, y. I mean, if you try to get your x's over to one side and your y's over to the other, you're not going to be able to make this work. I mean, let's, let's mess around with this a little. Well, you can't proceed any further here. Your x, y is inside the sign, and you can't get it out. If you try to use the arc sign, it wouldn't work. I mean, the arc sign has a number of issues relating to domain and range. But the most obvious issue here is that the arc sign and the sign are prevented from casting each other out by this dx. If we covered up the dx, you'd get the arc sign of dy equals xy. But but you and and then you could try to do something. It wouldn't work. Um, the reason it wouldn't work is that now your dy is stuck inside an arc sign, and you can't. I mean, what the heck is this? You don't. Your dy can't be inside an arc sign. Your dy needs to just be out and free for when we integrate. Um, or if you try to take the arc sign first, that would be a slightly less non, maybe nonsensical thing to try, but But no dice. I mean, even if we ignore 
the domain and range issue, and we say the arc sign and the sign just cancel each other out. Sorry, this is the least professional thing I've ever done. I'm going to just text no to somebody. Um. Now your dy dx is stuck inside the arc sign and you can't get them on different sides. You can't separate them. So So this is not separate. There's nothing you can do with this using separation of variables. So it's not a magic sure sadly. Let's look at a situation where it works, but doesn't work as nicely as the two examples we just did. dy dx equals four minus two x over three y squared minus five. It's funny, uh, this probably looks a lot messier than this, but at least the integration is going to be a lot simpler here, she says, and then awkward silence as he realizes there must be an error in his notes. There we go. This is separable. Multiply both sides by the denominator. On the right. Multiply both sides by the denominator on the left, integrate, and a bunch of complications that showed up in the last two examples don't show up here. There's not going to be You know, exponentials, there aren't going to be stray plus or minus signs floating around. The left integrates, the right integrates, they're both polynomials, they integrate easily, I hope. Our constants of integration combine. And we get this. Nice and easy integration. The problem is that um that we cannot solve for y. You know, we've got that y cubed minus 5y. There's no way to combine those and get y equals something. So this happens really frequently. And when it does happen, the solution is called implicit. And that's um, having an implicit solution is fine. I mean, in today's age of technology, we can just go to Desmos and we can look at this solution, even though we can't solve for it. 
let me do just that. Let's graph y cubed minus five y equals four x minus x squared. And then we don't know what C is, but we can type plus C and then add a slider and different values of C give us different graphs. It's kind of a fun graph or an interesting graph to see for large values of C. It's in one piece as it were, but as C shrinks, it turns into two pieces. Let's discuss this graph and this differential equation further. Graphing is wonderful. Desmos and similar things are revolutionary, but they have to be treated with a certain amount of care. Let's take this differential equation and let's add an initial condition. Let's say y of zero ought to be zero. So when x equals zero, y equals zero. So x and y need to both be zero at the same time. If x and y are both zero at the same time, then we wind up with a zero cubed minus five times zero equals four times zero minus zero squared plus C. And we get that C equals zero. So going back to Desmos, get rid of that slider. We know what C is. We know that C is zero. So this graph is in two pieces, at least the way Desmos is displaying it. But when X is zero, we're up here. And now let's think of X as time. And let's ask ourselves what happens as time passes. And the answer is that you start here at zero. And then as time passes, as X gets bigger, we move along this curve until we reach this value, 4.881. And now what happens? Well, the answer is nothing really. Once we reach this value, we've gone as far as we can go. We can't jump down here. We've never seen anything that would allow us just to teleport from one part of the curve to the next. 
we can't start going and we can't just keep going because X is time and time is not allowed to run backwards. So as time passes, we reach this maximum value. Likewise, if we asked what happened in the past, I mean, contradicting myself a little because I said that time can't run backwards. But if we asked what happened in the past, well, if we look further and further into the past, we get to here. And then suddenly we're not looking further and further into the past anymore. We're going back into the future. What's actually happening here is that in spite of this very complicated curve, let's see if I can make Desmos do what I want it to. Let's see, why should be, I think, that give us an error message? Come on, Esmos. Okay, here we go. There. This is the only part of the curve that makes any sense with that initial condition. We start here. Time can pass for a while, and as time passes, we move to the right. But once we get here, we're done. Time can't run anymore. Or we could look into the past for a while. But once we get here again, we're done. So we have, when we go to Desmos, it says the curve looks like this, and it's a pretty crazy looking curve, and it's in two parts, and it's not a function. It doesn't satisfy the vertical line test. But only a small amount of this curve actually matters for our point of view. And this isn't something we're going to be looking at a lot in this class or maybe ever after today, but it's something to bear in the back of your mind. If you have implicit solutions, you're going to graph them, but you have to be cautious with graphs. Questions? I have one more comment to make. These integration techniques, the two of them we now know, or rather I should say these solution techniques, the two of them that we now know, integration from last week, separation of variables from today, these both give us infinite classes of solutions. And in both situations, that comes from the same thing. In with both of these techniques, we're performing integration, and we get a constant of integration, and that constant of integration can be anything, so we have an infinite number of solutions. And we call what we get 
from this. The general solution. And our terminology is a bit bad because solution is singular. And we know that actually we have an infinite class of solutions, but you know, it's not so bad. I mean, if you look here and you say, we have this differential equation, what's the solution? And you say, well, the solution is an arbitrary constant times e to the kx. I mean, you're being a little fuzzy by using the singular, but we've written this infinite class of solutions down as one thing, right? There's k times e to the lowercase k times x. Occasionally, and again, this isn't something we should obsess over. It's just something we'll mention and then see an example of. Occasionally, when we use separation of variables, we lose a solution. And the solution we lose is usually not a terribly interesting one. But let's see what I mean by this. dy dx equals 6x times y minus 1 to the two-thirds power. This is separable. We can divide both sides by y minus one to the two-thirds. We can multiply both sides by dx. And now we can integrate both sides uh, y minus one to the two thirds in the denominator is the same as having a negative two thirds. Um, we're technically doing a little u substitution. We let u be y minus one, but at the end of the day, we get that on the left. And we get this on the right. And we can divide both sides by three. And we can, huh, and then something more simple than I thought, but we can, let's see, oh getting something more simple than I thought because I made a mistake. I forgot the constant of integration. We can tube both sides. And I was going to say, really? We're just going to get x to the sixth? 
but we're not going to get x to the six because of that constant of integration. We get y equals one plus this. So y is a um, sixth degree polynomial. And this is the general solution. And there is one solution that is not one plus x squared plus c cubed. And that solution turns out to be constant. Y equals one is also a solution. Go back to this. And let's look. Oh, we have no space here. So let's instead go to a new frame. I'm claiming y equals one is a solution. Let's see. The derivative of one is a zero. One minus one is zero. Zero equals zero. Check. Y equals one is a solution. So why don't we get it? There's no value of C that will make the thing we're looking at on this frame be one. Why did we lose this solution? Well, the answer is that to do separation of variables, you pretty much always are going to be doing some kind of division. And we cannot divide by zero. To do separation of variables, I divided by y minus one to the two thirds. Well, when I did that division, I was assuming that y isn't one. So I lost the solution. Okay, so I was just saying that to do separation of variables, you know, 90, most of the time you're going to be doing a division step. You've got a y on the right and you're going to be dividing. In fact, I'll say you're always doing a division step, because if you didn't have a y on the right, it wouldn't be separation of variables, it would just be integration. So when you do a division step, you're implicitly assuming that something isn't zero, because you can't divide by zero. Here, when we divided by y minus one to the two thirds, we had to assume that that wasn't zero. And y minus one to the two thirds not being zero is the same as y not being one. Occasionally though, that assumption you make actually is a solution. Here we have to assume that y does not equal one, but y could be one. Y being one is a perfectly valid solution. Um, when a situation like this occurs, we call, we get a stray solution. You know, here we have an infinite 
number of solutions. And then we have this one stray solution that doesn't fall into that class. And when that happens, that stray solution is called singular. So this differential equation has a singular solution. In addition to the infinite number of solutions, the infinite class of general solutions, we found using separation of variables. Um, singular solutions usually aren't very interesting. I mean, interesting in inverted quotes, because I don't know if most people in their heart of hearts would describe this as interesting. Interesting. But what I mean is, it's very common for the singular solution just to be a constant, like y equals one. And this is not an interesting solution. I mean, again, if you think of x as time, this is saying that there's really no relationship between x and y. Time passes and y just sits there. So that's what I mean when I say that it's not interesting because X and Y aren't interacting with each other. Okay, so the next few sections are going to be applications of separation of variables. If I remember correctly, we'll look at population models this week, and then we'll look at air resistance next week.